I think we can all agree that brushes are a really cool part of digital painting, but they can also be daunting. I mean, with all this selection and ability to customize and iterate to no end, how do you know which brush or brushes you should be painting with? So I'm gonna do a little experiment where I forget about all that and just paint with the round brush. And I'll keep that round brush on 100% opacity and with just one layer. I'm gonna paint Batman, of course, because I always paint Batman when I'm experimenting with stuff. If you've seen my video about style, you already knew that. So because the only thing on screen I care about is what's happening in this area here, I'll slide this little whiteboard in on the right so we can jot down some notes as we go. And the first note is, the round brush is pretty versatile. You can get a clean line with it, you can get controllable tones. The round brush is pretty responsive too, so I can switch between line and tone and manage different parts of the art process pretty quickly. Now, of course, I constantly change my brush size as I work. My middle and index fingers are habitually glued to the square bracket keys. And by the way, I'm also using a tablet, so I do have some opacity control with the pen pressure. Here's a big helping of the round brush here to block in overall compositional tones, and then switching right away to a smaller brush to start blocking in some finer drawing points. And now right back to a bigger brush to keep blocking in big sections. And that includes some of the shadow shapes that are being introduced now. You know one thing I really like about the round brush? Because it's kind of featureless, it really goes down easy design-wise. Like if you use a textured brush, you have to contend with those obvious repetitions that occur with a digital brush. Now, of course, the round brush repeats as well, but due to its lack of features, it's not nearly as obvious to the eye. Now, of course, you can still achieve interesting variety with the round brush by changing things like brush size, the distance between strokes, the length of the stroke, the direction of the stroke, or overlapping one type of brush stroke on top of another type, if you look at how Batman is developing right now, you can see that mindset at work. I'm rarely ever satisfied with just one pass over an area. Instead, I'm constantly looking for that variety of brushwork. And again, because I'm only using the round brush, I can rest assured that the brushwork will be compatible. If anything, I think this exercise in reduction can help you understand how brushwork fits together in a painting. Again, what I'm after here is not to reform you into always painting with the round brush. It's just that by reducing variables and possibilities, we can actually gain more insight into what's fundamental to the process. These are lessons you can then apply to a broader brush set. All right, switching gears now to a bit of lighting talk here. I didn't have any plans for this when I set out to paint it. So just by accident, I've kind of added this secondary light source coming in from the right, now coming in from the left because I just flipped the painting. It looks like a pretty direct hard light, like maybe from the headlights of a car or something. Then coming in from the right, I have a diffuse light, maybe like light coming down from the sky. Probably I was thinking about last month's video, which was a breakdown of diffuse light. This is another form of variety, one thing versus another thing. I mean, they're both light, but different types of light. That combined with different types of brush strokes, you know, different patterns, different lengths. These are the things that lend interest to a painting. I actually come from a traditional painting background. I learned to paint in oils and watercolor before I learned digital. And I find that with traditional media, interesting brushwork happens more naturally. Because you're working with organic materials from the start, this whole thing about variety is already kind of baked into the process. With digital, I find you have to work a little harder to prevent the computer's desire to repeat things so much. One way my watercolor experience has influenced my digital approach is that when I'm adding shadows or darker tones, I'll kind of overshoot where I want to be and pick a very dark color and value, and then simply use the pressure of my stylus to kind of build towards darkness in sequential transparent passes. In watercolor, you do something very similar with wet over dry washes. The round brush is surprisingly good at this kind of application, and it introduces that little bit of imperfection that can help make things organic and interesting. So what I'm doing right here on the Batman painting is similar but with a digital twist. I'm darkening the entire mask area, but I don't want to lose the strokes that I've already built up. So I simply switched my brush to multiply mode, which is a darkening mode, and was pressing pretty hard on the stylus to get a consistent darkening of tone. You'll notice I kept the direction of those strokes kind of parallel, because I didn't necessarily want to add texture here. I simply wanted to take everything a step down in value. I guess multiply mode is one digital luxury I'm allowing myself in this exercise. 
But it's just another way to get this kind of sculpted look to your modeling. Instead of turning form with blended tones or airbrushing, it's more like chiseled steps. This is not necessarily better, but it does force you to think about each individual plane change, which again is a fundamental of painting. Can I tell you a quick story for a second? I'm playing my old man card here, but I got my first ever copy of Photoshop back when Photoshop looked like this. <clears throat> and that's Photoshop 4, not CS4. Anyway, the reason I'm telling you this is back then, Photoshop wasn't really imagined as a painting software. It was made for photo manipulation, you know, hence the title Photoshop. So as far as painting went, it really only offered brushes as basic as the round brush. And you had these artists out there like Craig Mullins, who was a very early adopter of Photoshop, just doing this incredible work. I mean, rumor had it back then he was just painting with a mouse, not even a tablet. Still don't know if that's true, but I mean, this was back in the mid 90s, so it probably was. Digital painting just wasn't a popular thing yet. So anyway, I consider myself lucky to have gotten into digital painting when the tools were still pretty limited because it forced me to work within those limitations. And the thing that I've learned from that is that working within limitations breeds innovation. For instance, if I want some kind of fancy texture like you currently see on Batman's cape there, well, the round brush doesn't have any texture. But does that mean I can't do it? No, I'll find a way to do it. And when you think that way, you're dealing more with the fundamentals of a painting, rather than trying to shop for the perfect tool to fit what your vision is. You flip that, you stretch the tools you have to match your vision. And once you can do that, the more elaborate tools, like better brushes for instance, actually become more powerful in your hands. But okay, this is old man yells at cloud, I know. We'll move on. I wasn't real happy with how light the diffuse light got. So I'm kind of redoing the entire front facing side of Batman's head here. And when I build it back up now, I'll make sure that diffuse light is rendered much more dimly. This harkens back to the note we made earlier about how the round brush goes down easy design-wise. I'm not afraid of obliterating entire chunks of the painting and redoing it, because I know that visual brush language will stay intact automatically. <laughs> Let's do a bit of digital cheating now. But something cool is actually happening here. You see that red that was left behind when I scaled Batman's head? I'm painting over it, right? But not completely. I've accidentally left a few bits of it behind. Those remaining bits of red, like around the base of his neck, they don't make literal sense, but I would suggest that they do help the color harmony. In this case, they bring that strong red on the left side of the picture and subtly distribute it throughout other parts of the picture. This is a very common technique that I learned back in oil painting. You would tone the canvas, commonly with like a burnt sienna or something, and then the simple act of painting other colors over that tone, little bits of that tone would show up throughout and it would basically unify the color in an interesting way. I've done something like this in other parts of this Batman painting too, not just that neck area. See if you can spot where subtle reds are mixed in with those blues. This whole painting, color-wise, is very simple. It's essentially red versus blue. Here in the flesh tones I'm working now, I'm letting the reds dominate, which makes sense because it's skin after all, but I'm still acknowledging the blue side of my color scheme even in those same flesh tones. The blues are just a little grayer to accommodate the more saturated reds. And then Batman's suit and most of the background reverses that, and I'm favoring or saturating the blues while subduing or graying off the reds. This is typically how you want to handle a color scheme dominated by two colors. Every area should be some ratio of the two. Of course, a large part of those decisions is dictated by where the light's coming from. Obviously, this part of Batman's emblem is going to be redder than this part, due to which part is facing which light. If you'd like to go deeper on managing color temperature and different saturations of your colors, check out episode 5 of my 10 Minutes to Better painting series, all about color harmony. Alright, so I'm nearing the end here, and I know I'm nearing the end because I'm making smaller and smaller adjustments. That tells me that, for better or worse, I've answered all the visual questions that this painting puts forth. At least, as I perceive them. Of course, as with any painting, you could always keep working on it. But there comes a point of diminishing returns, or worse, there comes a point where you can undo all the hard work you've done so far. And I don't want to fall into that trap, so let's call this finished. Okay, one last thing. This painting is pretty dark, which befits the Dark Knight, but on a hunch, I want to go up to Image Auto Contrast. And I'm not entirely happy to say I like that better. 
I've called up a fade slider here to dial it back just a bit. I don't want the full effect of that. I'll go with something around 60%. All right, and there it is, the final Batman round brush experiment. That was fun, and I hope you'll try it out too. I really think this is time well spent. Okay, time for a cool announcement. So when I quit my job 10 years ago and went freelance, I knew two things had to be of very high quality, my artwork and my website. I also knew that I wanted to spend most of my time on my art and not as much time on my website. That's not always the best position to be in. But Squarespace can come to the rescue. Choose a template from literally hundreds of professional looking sites. You can preview it on your desktop, as well as ensure that it looks good on multiple devices. Once you've made a selection, Squarespace's world-renowned editor is power at your fingertips. Adjust any property associated with any page with simple buttons and sliders. Adjust color schemes and upload your own images, and you've got a personal gallery ready to go in minutes. And if you don't like any of your chosen templates' pages, just delete what's there and swap it out for a new one. And the best part isn't even that you'll have a great website, it's that you'll have the most time left over for your artwork. Visit squarespace.com slash marcobucci and use my code marcobucci for 10% off at checkout. And that's all for today, folks. Subscribe to the channel for ongoing content, and I'll see you in the next video.